I'm Sotez, I'm one of the co-founders of Nizor Manish. I'm going to cover some of the movements and specific individuals who were um, involved in 1971. And um, prior to this, we're going to take a step back and discuss resistance to British colonial, um, colonialism itself, covering some historic moments. Uh, we'll also reflect on how lessons around diversity of tactics and movement building can apply uh, today. So looking at the here's a couple points. Uh, as a historical event, anti-colonialism refers to the struggle against imperial rule in colonized countries, mostly during the first half of the 20th century. Uh, revolutionary anti-colonialism historically has often uh, employed strategies of violent revolt against colonial regimes. Historically, this is where we're going to be starting our conversation from. Before. Right. At this moment, I think what I'm doing is I'm going to be handing over to T. So we're really lucky because both T and Tass are fabulous um, uh, co-founders of Nizar Manush and they bring a lot and you're going to uh, you're going to recognize this very quickly. Both of them are experienced organizers, campaigners, and they freelance across a whole load of things, everything ranging from working on human rights issues around the world to organizing businesses, um, uh, traders, lo local people. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we're going to kick off uh, by looking at a few key revolutionary figures and movements in the resistance to British colonialism. So the first figure we're in, gonna introduce you to uh, was known as uh, Syria Sen, and very fondly known as Master Da. Um, and we've got a little video, which should hopefully work. Um, so yeah, sit back and do let us know if you can't hear the sound. 12th January, 1934. The day is marked in Indian history when Bengali freedom fighter Surya Sen, along with comrade Tarakeshwar Dastidar, were hanged by the British government. By 1923, Surya Sen, who was popularly known as Master Da, spread the revolutionary organization to different parts of Chittagong district now in Bangladesh. He led a guerrilla war against the oppressive British government. One of his successful undertakings was a robbery at the Treasury Office at the Bengal Assam Railway at Chittagong on December 23, 1923 in broad daylight. His major achievement in the anti-British revolutionary struggle was the Chittagong Armoury Raid on April 18, 1930, when he captured the British Armoury and unfurled the national flag. He also formed an unstable government. Surya Sen was successful in keeping the colonial British rulers paranoid about his anti-colonial resistance movement. On 16 February 1933, the British got hold of him, only made possible by betrayal by one of his close relatives, Netra Sen. Special tribunals tried Surya Sen, Tarakeshwar Dastidar and Kalpana Datta. Surya Sen, along with his comrade Tarakeshwar Dastidar, were hanged. The flame he ignited in the minds of millions of youth in India paved the way for the freedom of our country from British imperialism. The Indian government released a commemorative stamp in his memory in 1977, and Bangladesh did so too in 1999. So we're, we're gonna spend a little more time um, learning about Syria um, and, and thinking about the armory raid that was just mentioned in the video. You um, may be familiar with Syria, but it's good to have a little background. He was the principal organizer of the Chittagong armory raid, which took place in 1930 against the British government. Um, when he was younger, he was initiated into his revolutionary ideas by his teacher. Um, and at the time, um, the revolutionaries uh, were divided into two active groups known as Anushilan and Jugantar. And Surya attempted to reunite the two revolutionary parties into one group. Um, in 1919, students of Chittagong boycotted their classes and organized public meetings to protest the Jallianwala Balag uh, Bag massacre. They continued, they continued their systemic movement by boycotting classes, courts, and arranging protests and demos. So, um, as has been mentioned, uh, Surya was the key kind of architect behind the Chittagong Armory Raid. Um, so yeah, again, this took place in 18, uh, the 18th of April in 1930. And this was an attempt to raid two major British armories in Chittagong uh, with, the, with the intention to distribute the weapons to other revolutionaries and establish an armed unit. Unfortunately, they didn't manage to locate ammunition during the raid, uh, but they did succeed in cutting the telephone and telegraph wires to isolate the city. Um, and they also managed to kind of uh, break down the railway links um, between the city and the rest of Bengal. However, because they hadn't managed to locate that ammunition, 
um, they knew they wouldn't be able to uh, engage the British in an open battle. When they anticipated the consequences of what they'd done, um, they left the Chittagong Hills and they were looking for a, a safe place to stay. Um, however, on April 22nd in 1930, uh, the British Army personnel caught up with them on Jalabalad uh, Hill and they engaged in a brutal standoff where 12 of the revolutionaries died um, and 80 of the British Army personnel also died. Um, Sen and his comrades escaped into the neighbouring village um, and they uh, divided themselves into small groups and conducted guerrilla raids uh, and surprise attacks on colonial personnel and property. Um, and yeah, following on from that, the British embarked on a series of brutal combing, combing operations around the villages uh, where the revolutions were in hiding. Um, and actually, despite like the ensuing brutality, the villagers didn't betray uh, Surya and his comrades. They actually offered them support. And as I mentioned, a close relative of Surya actually betrayed him. And so he was arrested on the 16th of February in 1933. And he was jailed um, and then he was really brutally tortured by the British. Uh, there's actually reports of how his bones, limbs and joints were shattered by a hammer and all of his nails were torn, torn out. Um, but yeah, despite all the torture, his spirit never broke. Um, and on the 12th of January in 1934, he was hung by British forces and died. And we just got a picture here of um, a wanted poster uh, that the British created um, in, in the search for him. But yeah, um, as you're going to see, um, a lot of our figures were really kind of uh, revolutionary figures were really inspired by Surya's uh, leadership um, and his courage um, and kind of the ideals that he held, um, and they kind of had a very long-lasting legacy. Um, and yeah, we just kind of wanted to make some links because just like just to connect back um, to kind of our previous session, um, and I mentioned how um, during the days of the British Empire, um, we definitely saw an exchange of repressive tactics between colonial forces. However, that was also mirrored by the exchange of um, inspiration and solidarity between colonized people. And so we just looked at the Chittagong Armory raids, and this was actually inspired by the 1916 Easter Rising in Ireland um, against British occupation. And that was a major turning point in the Irish revolutionary struggle, which actually ended in Ireland's partition. Um, and Juganta, so that kind of revolutionary group that I mentioned that Surya joined, um, and reunited, they borrowed ideas and methods from the original IRA's campaign against the British. Um, and at a later date, the Hindustan Republican Army, uh, later known as the Hindustan uh, Socialist Republic Association, they were also influenced by um, the IRA and formed as a bit of a breakaway from um, the pacifist kind of politics that, that Gandhi practiced. Okay, we're gonna look at one more revolutionary figure. So this is Priti Lata Wadidar. Um, she was born in Chittagong. She was a promising student and she was actually the first Bengali woman to pick up arms against the British. Um, so when she was in Eden College in Dhaka, that's kind of when her first anti-British sentiments began to take form. That's where she was connected with other revolutionary groups. Uh, there's a, a person called uh, Leela Nang, who was an associate of Subhash Chandra Bose. And Bose actually established what was known as the Deepali Sankha, um, a revolutionary group that provided combat training to women. Um, she went on to study philosophy in Calcutta Uni. And actually at the time, um, and it happened to a few others, but her degree was held back by the British authorities. And it was actually the first, um, her first urge to resist um, came from, from that kind of action. Um, actually, and after her studies, she began to teach um, at a local English school um, and was appointed as headmistress. Um, you may have heard of um, Ash Sarkar. And Priti Lata was actually Ash Sarkar's great, great aunt. And she's read an incredible, she's written an incredible um, piece in The Guardian about it. So I do encourage you to read that in your own time. Okay, we're gonna stick with Pretty Lata's story though. We're gonna keep going. So when Pretty Lata was in college, you know, she was at uni, this is where she was, she met Surya Sen, you know, who we just looked at. So it was around this time she approached him and she requested to be recruited into his armed group of young revolutionaries. However, it was not very common for uh, Master Da to have women amongst his uh, group. And actually some of the members along with him were very hesitant and they actually in initially objected to her membership. Um, however, she had a really clear and kind of apparent devotion to the cause of freedom. And she was actually really effective at carrying out assignments undetected by the police, actually because she often um, disguised herself as a male 
um, and she was very good at doing that. So yeah, actually during the Chittagong raid, um, she was she was involved in that, and actually she managed um, to escape and regroup with a few others over the coming months. And Surya originally originally had this plan um, to lead an attack on the Paharatali European Social Club in Chittagong. Um, so for those of you who are not aware of it, but um, it were, had very racist and discriminatory practices towards Indians. It kind of proudly display, displayed this sign called, which said, dogs and Indians are not allowed. But actually in 1932, um, she was disguised as a Punjabi man and uh, Priti Lata led a team of fighters in an attack um, on the club. Um, and she'd actually uh, trained everyone with her to actually um, take potassium cyanide in the case of like being captured. So she was very, um, skilled in arms and she kind of was teaching um, the team um, those skills um, and yeah this was a social club that was like frequented by British colonial officers it was like one of their mainstays um, and Wazada and her comrades torched the club um, and they ended up killing one British woman and injuring 11 other people and they were also the group was shot at, at by the police um, so yeah she did sustain a bullet wound um, in that attack and it kind of stopped her escaping um, and as kind of she trained her group to do she consumed uh, potassium cyanide to evade arrest, and she ended her life at a very tender age of 21. Um, such was her desire not to kind of uh, be in British hands. And I kind of, I think we wanted to kind of really raise the point here that for Priti Lada, Wadizer, and many other women in the freedom struggle, armed anti-colonial insurrection was often the only means by which they could achieve their liberation. Um, and some of her final um, documented words were, I earnestly hope that my sisters will no more think themselves weaker and will get themselves ready to face all dangers and difficulties and join the revolutionary movements in their thousands. And yeah, I suppose just also just, just to mention that um, we'll include it in our resource notes. There's, like, there's many incredible revolutionary women. We don't have time to cover them all. There was Kalpana Dutta um, and, and many people who were friends with Piti Lata. Um, but we'll have more of them on our, um, in our resource pack. And there's a few questions that we want you to think about. Hey everyone, and welcome back from the break. Now moving on, I'm going to now introduce one of the world's most famous poets. I'm sure all of you have heard of him before, but if not, um, introducing Rabin Janat Thakur. And he was a poet, writer, artist, musician, and also a freedom fighter. And he was also the first non-European to win a Nobel Prize in literature. Not only did he single-handedly create a complete modern universe of Bengali literature, he was very much involved in the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist movements of that time. Thakur wrote songs in support of the Indian nationalist movement and also started composing songs during the first anti-partition movement, which was in 1905, where the the British partitioned Bengal into East and West. And one of the most famous songs, Atla Cholo Rare, and this directly translates to Go On Your Way Alone. Um, and this song was part of the 22 protest songs, which were written specifically for the anti-partition movement. This song in particular, along with several others, were actually banned by the British due to its revolutionary nature. So I'm gonna just play this song, and if everyone can just write what thoughts and themes come into your mind when you hear this song jodi tor dak shuni kyu na she tobe ekla cholo re ekla cholo ekla cholo ekla cholo ekla cholo re jodi tor dak shuni kyu na she tobe ekla cholo re jodi tor dak shuni kyu na she tobe ekla cholo re Tambur 
saying um, he remembers hearing this for the first time at the Alto Ballet Story performance back in 2019, going with the theme of the protests that would take place in the 70s, 80s in the UK. And Musharat is saying um, being activist can be a lonely space yeah it can make you get in your head yeah that's very true so this song was one of the 22 protest songs written during the Swadashi period which I'll go on to explain and Thakur joined the Swadashi movement delivering lectures and composing patriotic protest songs other songs included Amashona Bangla which is obviously Bangladesh's um, national anthem Thakur initially joined the movement, delivering lectures. Um, at the time of the movement, he really asserted education and unity as the two sole reasons he wanted to propagate by joining this movement. And by singing these uh, protest patriotic songs in a procession and marching along the streets, Another one of the 22 protest songs also is a really famous song called Banglar Mati Banglar Jor, uh, which translates to the earth of Bengal, the water of Bengal, which became an example of like Hindu and Muslim solidarity during that time. And Thakur also participated in organizing assemblies where people alongside him would be singing all these songs, marching from the upper circular road to Bagh Bazaar. Tagore was also critical in bringing into existence a Swadashi coalition by further consolidating the political alliances between the Calcutta leaders within West Bengal and their East Bengal following, which was nothing less than a revolution in the political structure of Bengal society. And now moving on to the Swadashi movement. In the 1900s, Bengal was the major province in British India um, and the Indian national movement began in Bengal and thus Britishers decided to partition Bengal in 1905. It was actually the first ever partition under um, British colonial rule and this was Lord Curzon, the, the then Viceroy of India, announced this partition in 1905 and thus the Bengalis initiated the first organised insurrection against the partition known as Bangla Banga, or the anti-partition movement, also known as the Swarashi movement. So on the 16th of October 1905, the protest day was considered as a national mourning day and a general strike declared. And all the shops were shuttered, public ve vehicles were halted and people fasted. And in the morning, people walked barefoot chanting, I bow to the motherland. And they, uh, irrespective of caste and religion, all... Yeah, took a bath in the sacred um, waters as well as a symbol of unity. The main agenda of the movement was that all honorary members of um, the magistrate, employees of district boards, the village councils, all would resign. And for the next one year, national mourning would be perpetuated by the Bengalis. British rule over India had broken India's industrial self-sufficiency and the boycott was mainly an economic weapon aimed to strike a financial loss by discarding British goods and re recovering the idea of self-sufficiency. Um, and like the boycott, the Swadashi dealt a severe blow to the British economy. The movement can be considered as one of the pop most popular revolts which ensured participation of all different sections of people, students, women, middle class, lower classes, zamindas, which are landlords and peasants were, were all you know participated within the movement and you know during this movement the Bengali shunned foreign clothes made by the British lawyers seized attending court students boycotted schools and colleges you know the Swadashi movement became a great anti-British force and students played a significant role in this by propagating the message uh, to the remotest villages around um, East and West Bengal. So the movement resulted in devastating financial loss for the colonial rule. Bombings also took place in public buildings, armed robberies were staged, and British officials were also executed. Later movements by Gandhi from 1915 one of his most famous movements, the non-cooperation movement, the non-violent resistant movement, were all based on this uh, Swadashi movement. And although strengthening this movement at that time, obviously Gandhi receives many criticisms, including his closeness with the Indian bourgeois and caste and, and caste and race politics. So the subsequent unification of Bengal in 1911, so that's six years after partitioned it, 
a unification of this came to be regarded as the mark of the Sotashi movement's success. Obviously, this was something that came undone with the eventual partition of India and Pakistan upon independence. I would now jump into breakout rooms again. And these are some questions that we're going to be discussing. Yeah, and just for a little bit more um, context on top of that, we've obviously looked at lots of moments today, but we've also highlighted some individuals. So this is just for us to be able to unpack this. Never enough time <laughs> in the breakouts, is it? Never enough time. Okay, so now just jumping ahead a few years to another key example of, of resistance and obviously Bangladesh is the most known example of revolting against oppressors is obviously the Liberation War of 1971, the fight for independence. Obviously in 1971, East Pakistan sought to achieve fully autonomous statehood and obtain its sovereignty from West Pakistan in a war that lasted nine months. Uh, accounts say up to three million Bangladeshis were killed and up to 500,000 women were raped. So it's just like a general chain of events, because I think it's important to quickly look through the chain of events that actually led to the liberation. As a lot of people, I think, mistakenly assumed the 1952 language movement was the direct catalyst, but actually there was a lot of other things going on, you know, under West Pakistani rule. It was, you know, a total political, social, linguistic and economic exploitation from West Pakistan, you know, and culturally we were seen as inferior to them, our religion was seen as inferior to them. Um, the 1952 language movement, obviously, where the Pakistani government imposed Urdu, the so national language, led to protests erupting, and then the government officially granted status to the Bengali language in 1956. Moving on, we have also the 1970 Bola cyclone, which was the world's so the most deadliest tropical cyclone, which killed more than half a million people in East Bengal, wiped out entire villages. And this was a pivotal moment due to pa the Pakistani government's very slow response to the, the suffering and then obviously we have uh, the 1970 first supposedly democratic elections secured off the back of mass agitation that led to the downfall of President Ayub Khan. The Awami League, headed by Sheikh Mujib, swept to victory in the national elections. And this was also largely due to the dissatisfaction um, over relief efforts over the uh, over the cyclone. I'm not going to play the video just because of time restraints, but we'll, we will just send it. We'll just put it in the chat. And it's just, you know, Sheikh Mujib's most famous speech. The, so the events of 1971 are often individualised within Mujib himself. But though he played a pivotal role, the events leading up to 1971 um, that occurred during the Liberation War and in the early years of Bangladesh were shaped by people's movements and social forces, which are often left out of the story. Now moving on to just look at some revolutionary women of 1971. And I just picked out some of my four kind of favourite stories that I had come across while I was doing my undergraduate. So this is Kakon Bibi, and she was an indigenous freedom fighter, um, and she belonged to the Kassia ethnic group. And she used her marriage to her ex-husband, who was a Pakistani, to gather information during the Liberation War. She was arrested and brutally tortured by the Pakistani army, but finally she was released after she convinced them that she was searching for her Punjabi husband, um, who was actually her ex-husband. Then the Pakistani gave her a pass and requested her to spy for them Obviously, what, what started happening, she started providing information about the Pakistani army camps to the freedom fighters. Here we also have Shirin Banu Mittal, who was actually inspired by a previous revolutionary that we had touched upon, Pritilita, to go join the 1971 war. Um, and she even disguised herself as a boy similar to, to Pritilita as well. And she said in an interview before she passed, she liked the idea of being disguised as a boy. My aunt, before I went to war, said I can go as I don't look like a girl. So Shirin fought in battles and also mobilized uh, public opinion in favor of the liberation war. She was also a member of the Communist Party of Bangladesh and she was the forefront of, of many battles during 1971. And during that time, you know, a lot of freedom fighters didn't have many arms and ammunition. So they literally fought with fishing tools um, that they created themselves, and kitchen knives, sticks and spears, things like that. These are just two freedom fighters, first called Dilruba Begum. She recruited, um, organized and helped train six groups of young men to fight in Bangladesh's Liberation War of 1971. And then we have Tamarun Bibi, and she would cook for the freedom fighters, hide arms for them, gathered information from the Pakistani military, and also took part in face-to-face -face combat. Tamarun Bibi would pretend to not be in her right mind 
mind in order to observe the positions of the Pakistani army in different areas during the, the Liberation War. So now we covered a lot of different revolutionaries today and different movements from colonial powers to oppressive powers, which we've seen many different tactics and roles have been used, you know, from freedom fighters to artists, musicians, educators and protesters. And in doing so, we would need to reject two hardline positions. On one hand is the idea that change comes from individual leaders alone, the great man of history theory, which discounts the role of the masses. And on the other hand is the idea that people can change history spontaneously without any form of political organisation. And both these theories mirror one another by discounting the central role of mass organisation in assessing political developments, coordinating political responses, drawing on organisers to build movements, connecting up struggles and creating a cultural and intellectual ecosystem and so on. You know, leaders obviously play a crucial role in gluing organizations together but what is really needed to make change and what some of the examples we have given try to illustrate is the importance of organizers in the broader sense not everyone can be a leader but everyone had and has a role in the movement towards that liberation and revolutionary change and i guess it's about using your own unique strengths and unique power in thinking about you know what is your specific role within the movement and just to i guess consider you know, as a question to all you guys to consider what strengths do you have and what skills would you like to also build on? We'll send you all this in our like resource packs as well. This is a really, really helpful diagram and this suggests further roles for, you know, everyone. And this is quite an effective, healthy and sustainable social change ecosystem. And that to acquire that requires, you know, different actors to play different roles and often at different times. We're going to be definitely looking in, in, in future sessions about how we like develop our own campaigning skills. So I think we just wanted to leave you with those questions, right? Um, and just that reflection. I think we're checking out now, right? Yeah, yeah. And first and foremost, thank you to Tas and uh, uh, Tasnima and T for like running us through and taking us through, hopefully through our objectives of like getting a bit more of a comprehensive understanding of the history of Bengal, its relationship to anti-colonialism and resistance. And yeah, and thinking about leadership and movement building, the lessons of the past and what we should do going into the future. So I hope everyone does feel like we've learned if um met some of those objectives and people have learned some new stuff 